what is striking the bar? Um, mallets have a huge number of variables associated with them. Um, obviously you have the mass, the weight of the bar, that's going to affect the overall force, which is one half mass times velocity squared. You have the material, uh, material of the core, which can be a variety of things. I've seen wood, I've seen rubber, I've seen latex, latex wrapped around rubber, um, injected polymers and all kinds of space agey stuff. Um, and then you have the shape of the head, which is overall going to uh, affect the shape of the mallet after you wrap it. And that'll, that'll determine how much of the mallet comes in contact with the bar. And then you have the yarn. Uh, you can have different types of yarn, uh, and, and those different types of yarns could be wrapped loosely, medium, tight. Some mallets, they start out tight, and then they go to a loose wrap. Uh, some mallets have two different kinds of yarn or cord or something wrapped around the mallet. And then some mallets don't even have yarn, like the Ensemble series for Vic Firth or Innovative Percussion. Uh, they just have the, I believe it's a rubber core, or maybe a plastic core, I'm not entirely sure, and then it has latex wrapped around it. And then we have, what bar is struck with what mallet? Because obviously, if you have a medium mallet and you're in the base register, you're going to get a very articulate and clear sound. But in the upper register, you're going to get kind of a poofy sound. Uh, and also, if you have a, a really hard mallet, in the upper register, it's going to sound clear and articulate. But in the base register, it's going to sound really harsh and full of overtones and, and more of a, a pingy sound. So these are three things up here, the material, the shape, and the yarn wrap. They affect how much energy is reflected or absorbed. Uh, and that's going to have an effect on how much of the core of the mallet digs into the bar. And what I mean by that is if you have a really bouncy core, then a lot of the force, or maybe not a lot, maybe some of the force, is going to be rebounded off the bar. Um, or if you have a mallet with a really loose yarn wrap, some of the force is going to get cushioned by that yarn, and it's not going to go into the bar. So you're going to have to work harder if you want the bar to resonate more. And that brings us to number six, grip used on the mallet. Uh, and I am hoping somebody is going to do some sort of study on this so we can put some myths here to rest as well. So we have a variety of two mallet grips, um, and, which, and when I say that, it basically means uh, people use a different fulcrum when they're using the two mallet grip. For example, we have the index finger fulcrum, where the thumb and index finger is the primary, um, the primary gripping point on the mallet, or the middle finger fulcrum, which is where the middle finger and thumb act as that point. And then we have what some people refer to as the back finger fulcrum, which is where the pinky and ring finger are wrapped fairly snug around the mallet, and they are the primary gripping point on the mallet. Um, and of course, we can hold the mallet tightly, or we can hold it more loosely in the hand. And then you have your four mallet grips. We have Stevens, Burton, Musser, cross grip, Gordon grip, six mallet grip. I've seen, I actually saw a guy play with eight mallets once. It was really cool, not really applicable to most pieces, but cool nonetheless. Um, so it, it is my personal understanding that the grip you use on the mallet doesn't really change the sound. So let's do another experiment. We'll call this quiz number two. I'm going to use a variety of these, mix them all together, and you tell me if you think you can hear which one is which. Here we go. Now, I don't know about you, but I didn't have I didn't hear much of a difference between those. Now, there's a couple notes I played a little louder than the others on accident, but the tone quality remained the same, and the length of the note remained the same every time. Um, and a lot of people, they, they try to test this out on their own, but they inadvertently play, um, you know, they'll go with an index finger fulcrum, and they'll play a certain velocity, and then they'll go to the middle finger fulcrum, and they won't play as loudly, and they'll say, oh, well, that sounds different. But it doesn't, 
they just didn't use the exact same velocity into the bar, and velocity is really the key factor here. Or another factor that can go into it is it's said that the audience hears with their eyes. Well, I, I'm willing to state that percussionists, they, we kind of hear with our hands. And if something feels tense in our hand, then we may perceive that sound as being shorter or a more harsh sound. If something feels really good and relaxed in our hands, we may perceive the sound as being more relaxed, even though it's not. Uh, for example, if you play the marching snare drum, or, or the regular snare drum, I suppose, um, I don't know if you've experienced this, but if I'm in a small room and I'm playing on the snare drum, uh, it, it will sound and feel a certain way. And then when I go outside or in a concert hall, the, the drum head is still at the same tension. I'm still using the same sticks, but because the sound is different, it, it actually affects the way that I feel the sticks. Like the sticks literally feel different when I'm playing just because the sound is so much different. So I think for us percussionists, the, the two are very closely related. And that may cause some people to kind of come to the assumption that your, your grip has a huge impact on sound when I think I've shown that it doesn't really have that, that much of an effect. If it does, I certainly can't tell, but I would love to see some studies where people really use some, some hardcore scientific techniques and instruments to discover this. Okay, now when you're recording a marimba, there's all kinds of variables to get thrown into this, and I don't really have time to talk about it. Uh, I just jotted some down so you can take a look. Uh, we have different mics and different chords that we can record with. Um, the recording interface, they capture audio differently. What bitrate and format the recording is stored at, they can have an effect on the sound. And then in post-production, we have all kinds of effects that can go in. We can compress it, we can adjust the equalizer, we can change the reverb, we can slap filters on it. But by the time a marimba CD comes out, we can't really tell what kind of marimba it is, or what kind of grip they're using, if you believe in that, or what kind of mallets they're using, or even what kind of room they're, they're in. They could be in a small room, but crank the reverb, and it sounds like they're in a huge concert hall. So I, I don't really have time to go into this. Maybe that's some material for a future episode. So in conclusion, uh, I believe the three biggest tone modifiers are the mallets that you use, where the bar is struck, and the room that you're in. Moderately important is the brand of the marimba, and once again, I'm assuming top quality rosewood marimbas. Obviously, your 50-year-old Musser Low A or your Yamaha Acoustalon is going to sound a little bit different than my marimba one. But assuming we're talking about top quality soloist rosewood marimbas, the, the effect that the brand has on sound quality is, is slight, but it's nothing in comparison to going from hard mallets to soft mallets, or from going from the center of the bar to the node of the bar, or from changing your performance venue from your practice room to Carnegie Hall or something like that. That's going to have a way, way more dramatic effect on your sound quality than just switching from you know a Yamaha to a marimba one or, or whatever. Now, stroke type and the grip, uh, I think I've shown, are kind of acoustically irrelevant. Now, it's not to say they, they are totally irrelevant, just they don't really have that much effect on the sound in comparison to some of the other variables I've listed. However, that brings us to the disclaimer. Okay, this is important. Before you flame, please pay attention to the following. Just because you can get the same sound using a variety of techniques does not mean that technique is irrelevant. Stroke type not only has an effect on the audience perception, but also your efficiency of motion. For example, most fast runs are impossible to play using downstrokes. Wouldn't recommend it. Uh, also, various four mallet grips will interpret complex passages differently. That's why you don't see people playing Gordon's Bicycle with Burton grip. I mean, I guess it's possible, but how, how the Burton grip handles those triple lateral strokes are completely different than how the Stevens grip handles them. And you'll be able to hear that. Okay, and lastly, and probably most importantly, is that good technique will help prevent permanent injury. If you can't play, then none of the previously mentioned things even matter. So take good care of your hands. Uh, I'm going to have another video, episode 2, that's going to talk about my ideas on technique and how to avoid injury, because I have a few of them, and I don't want you to get them. Thank you.